Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome. Thank you all for joining. This is the first session of the Carbon Friendly Forestry Conference. This is Reigniting the Flame, Returning Good Fire to the West's Forest Ecosystems. My name is Katie Fields, and I am the Forests and Communities Program Manager at Washington Environmental Council. We have a couple of logistical items to cover first before we get started. So if you run into any issues during the session or have any questions about the conference, please email the address that's pinned in the chat box to the right of the webinar screen. That's carbonconference at wecprotects.org. You can also use the chat box to send messages, but keep in mind that any messages will be visible to all attendees. If you'd like to submit any questions to the speakers, please use the Q&A feature, which you can access in your toolbar at the bottom of your webinar screen. We will be sorting through the questions and presenting them to the speakers at the end of the presentation. And as a reminder, this session is being recorded and will be shared with participants next week. All right, let's go ahead and get started then. Thank you all again for joining today. And since this is the first panel you'll see, uh, if you're joining us a little bit further into the session, folks are dropping names and organizational affiliations into the chat. Thank you very much for making introductions. And now on to the panel. The forest ecosystems of the West are adapted for fire. For millennia, Native people have managed forests with fire for food, food, fiber, and other uses. Intentional fire supports healthy forests that are resilient and less likely to experience severe wildfire. But more than a century of federal and state fire suppression policies and ecologically detrimental forest management practices, combined with climate change, have ushered in an era of catastrophic wildfire. Fortunately, momentum is building to return good fire to the forest and foster more resilient ecosystems. In this panel, Elizabeth Azuz from Cultural and Fire Management Council and Kara Karboski from the Washington Prescribed Fire Council will share insights into the historical role of fire, recent successes in returning cultural and prescribed fire to the landscapes of California and Washington respectively, and the barriers that remain. Now I'd like to introduce our two speakers. Elizabeth Azuz is the board secretary for the Cultural Fire Management Council, among other roles. And Kara Karboski is the program manager for the Washington Resource Conservation and Development Council. So first I'll go ahead and hand it over to Elizabeth to kick us off. Thank you so much for joining. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Uh, my name is Elizabeth Azus, and I am the secretary to the Board of Cultural Fire Management Council. We are an indigenous nonprofit profit, excuse me, in Northern California, and we do prescribed fire on uh, native ancestral territory, which is approximately 40,000 hectares in the Yurok uh, Reservation. Um, I'm really happy to be here this morning with you. Uh, I excuse me, I'm coming out of some tech difficulties here. My system didn't want to work. Part of my presentation this morning will focus on indigenous fire practice on the Yurok Reservation. I have been working with fire since I was four years old. I was taught by my grandfather, who is a Kruk tribal member. And basically, um, like any child, you will play with matches if you have spare time. So my grandfather caught me playing with matches and basically decided to teach me my responsibility as a true human being to the planet. So part of that training basically taught us what it was like to be on the land, to live on the land, to care for the land, how to manage our ecosystems, the water, the wildlife and everything that's here, our foods and medicines. And so as an adult, I have decided to take on this project along with uh, the Cultural Fire Management Council and our board. And basically what we do is restore our ecosystem. We started burning originally 10 years ago for uh, basket materials. Our women weave baskets and we use hazel and hazel is not usable unless it's burned. It's a serotonous plant. Uh, we also burn for bear grass, uh, acorns, huckleberries, many other food sources, as well as medicines and teas. Coming in this morning, um, part of the reason I really wanted to be here was we here in California are in the process of creating a prescribed fire program so that we would have cultural practitioners who would be able to be cultural fire burn bosses. It's a difficult program since we um, have to stay within the NWCG system, which makes it difficult for cultural practitioners who don't have those 
um, years of experience that the suppression fire agencies have or this uh, same education, I should say. So for me, um, I am a cultural practitioner. I do not wish to live in the NWCG system. However, we have, um, as I stated, this prescribed fire uh, burn boss program happening here in California. The only issues we're having with that is that on the national level, all these suppression organizations believe that they're the only ones that can work with fire simply because they have the NWCG quals or that they are, have a suppression background. For cultural practitioners, it's much different. You know, we're working in smaller acres or working in specific areas for specific um, plant types or species. Our botany program basically will go out and photograph all of our units before, during, and after a burn. And they'll document all of the native species that are in that area, document all the invasive species that we wish to remove. And then post burn, they will go back out and document those exact same species. In the process of all of that, about six to eight weeks after we burn, we'll go in and reseed those areas with plants that um, are indigenous to the area, that are food sources for the animals in this area. And we will be able to um, monitor our specific um, plant species and wildlife in order to be able to uh, further our program and to advance us. So for me, it's really important that um, we are able to work with our community, work with our tribe, and to be able to manage our land for living culture and wildfire prevention. We work very closely with the Yurok tribe and the fire department. We work well with the Hoopa fire department and the Kadok fire department. And basically all of these types of species that we, uh, you see here in this slide are things that are used for us to be able to um, maintain our life way. We have training exchanges where we bring people from all over the country around the world basically to learn what we do as far as prescribed practitioners, fire practitioners. As you can see, this young man here is uh, from the Pomo tribe. He had come to this area in order to learn how to bring fire back to the Clear Lake area in their extension of California. These young people come from all over the place to learn how to work with the land and learn how to burn safely in a um, contained controlled environment, if you will. Um, prescribed burning you know, requires a lot of prep for us. We go in, our crews work all year round to put in these fire lines, to put in these units. And then we bring people from all over the world to train them how to work with the land. These are some of the plant species that we um, work with. They're soap root and iris. Iris we use for thread. Um, as you can see the before and after pictures here, basically open up our oak understories and allow for our women to go in and gather acorns. These are some of the children in the community that are actually eating the fiddle ferns. And so they're taught how to gather them and how to process them and how to cook them. This is a Monica Yancey. She's one of our fire practitioners. She's been with us quite a few years and she um, is quite skilled and advanced and has moved up through the NWCG system in order to help us run our program. This is a prescribed fire that we did below an elder's uh, home. Basically, we go along and do fire protection throughout the community. We bring uh, community members together. We show them how to process their property for a burn. They do the ignitions and then we stand by in order to help them securely um, protect their property. This is a tribal member, uh, also one of Cultural Fire's board members. We're burning at his particular property. And as you can see, we burnt right down to the backs of the buildings. And then this is directly below his house. It was really a really wonderful burn to watch it walk down the hill slowly as it did.
This is after the burn was completed. Um, we basically stay, you know, for a few hours, watch, make sure everything is stable, that the homeowners are secure and comfortable. We do demonstration burns, as I stated. We bring tribes from all over the area. We teach them how to do prescribed burns, how to work with the equipment, how to safely um, work cooperatively, cooperatively, excuse me, with other agencies and how to um, take care of their land in general. This is our family burn program. Our executive director was teaching her grandchildren how to do a prescribed burn. And so she basically set out to do a prescribed burn with them and then created an AAR afterwards for the children. This is a local community member burning her piles in her home or near her home in order to protect herself from fire. Uh, this references the bootleg fire, um, which has thinning, thinning and prescribed fire, and then no treatment at all. And as you can see, there's quite an interesting um, mosaic landscape combined with that situation. Uh, this screen was basically something that came from our former uh, board member. He's passed on now, but fire is about new life. It purifies, excuse me, lost that slide. It purifies, and when spring comes around, grass, birds, everything is real, enjoyable, and new, and fresh, and the deer and elk and all wildlife come to the burned areas. So for us, um, this is a life path. Fire is family. Fire is something that we've worked with our entire existence um, since time immemorial. It not only keeps us warm, it heats our food, it takes care of our environment, it protects the land, it also protects the water. The smoke inversion layers will basically create a 10, I would say drop 10 degrees in temperature, drop the water temperature, I should say, in order for the fish to be able to travel up the river safely. So, um, gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just so excited to be here that it seems like everything is just coming out really jumbled. Um, I'd like to hand this back over to Katie and um, be available for any questions. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Next, we'll have Kara Karboski from the Washington Prescribed Fire Council speak. Kara Kaboski with the Washington Resource Conservation and Development Council. Um, I've been the coordinator for the Washington Pres Prescribed Fire Council since around 2013. Um, and so I've had almost a decade in uh, prescribed fire, uh, have some opportunities to do some work on the, the ground as well. But generally, uh, my role is really working to help others um, burn and increase the use of safe and effective fire. Um, I kind of have a bird eye view of this work and um, really helping and engage on policy, communications, and outreach to increase public understanding of fire, of prescribed fire, you know, partnerships and connections to help us all do this work better, and then training and learning, increasing our, our qualifications, our experience, and our ability uh, to do this work. Um, so thanks for having me today. Uh, Elizabeth, thanks. It's always wonderful to, to hear about the work that you all are doing down there uh, in California, and it's such an inspiration i um, looking forward to seeing a lot more of that type of work happening up here in Washington. And I think uh, what I'm most excited about, and maybe the, the theme really of my, my talk today is I'm pretty excited about what we have um, what we have going on here in Washington. So I'm I'm going to I'm not going to go too much into the detail of. Um, of uh, of history and context of, of fire. Uh, if you need more information, there are resources out there to learn about the, the role of fire in our forests and what's happened with fire suppression and forest management and how that's changed forest structure and contributed to you know what we have today. What I do want to mention, though, and I think it's really important, is um, this aspect of, of course, of, of how often fire has been on our landscape. And this tree cookie uh, uh, and this fire scar that's on this TNC website that actually has some good information as well. If you're interested, there's a link and I can provide it later. Uh, but really showing how frequent we had frequently we had fires here in certain parts of the state. And this was this tree cookie was somewhere in uh, the east side of the Cascades in central Washington. Uh, and you're looking at really like every 10 to 20 years of having a uh, fire return. And so some of that was natural fire. Some of that was, uh, you know, the native people who lived in that place uh, burning. Right. 
And so there was a lot of fire and it wasn't just on the east side. And that's another point I want to emphasize is there was fire on the west side of Washington as well. We tend to think of fire not happening on the west side. And there was a lot of that happening as well. The landscape that I live in Olympia would have looked a lot different <laughs> 200, 300 years ago. Uh, we've had dug for savannas, prairie, a lot more prairies than we currently have, oak woodlands. It doesn't take a, a long time for the landscape to change dramatically, for people to come in and, and start living on the prairies, <laughs> that, that land. And um, it doesn't take long for a dug fir to grow very, uh, very tall on the west side either. So looking outside your windows, really thinking about what was here before, and it was a lot more fire. And so the context here is, in general, there was a lot of fire, and we live in a fire landscape all across the state. Um, wildfire suppression, uh, as you can see from this tree cookie, that for the top part of that, that's all the years of fire suppression, right? And we've been very effective at fire suppression. Um, but as we've seen with, with changing climate, hotter, drier fire conditions, changing landscape and fuels conditions, um, it's not really, uh, we're in a different uh, state of being now. Uh, and that's kind of one of the things that we're working on with prescribed fire. Um, so when it comes to sort of the current state of prescribed fire, um, it looks like it's cut off a little bit, but um, that says current state of prescribed fire and, and uh, policy and funding. I want to provide a little bit of just some of the higher context and background. Um, and, and really, there has been a lot of support over the last few years from our federal and state governments to support prescribed fire. Um, you know, referencing the, the Infrastructure Investments and Jobs Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, whatever you want to call it, elements in there to provide funding for federal agencies to work on wildfire mitigation, forest health, and prescribed fire. Um, some of that funding is really uh, prioritized, being prioritized for Washington um, as well. Um, there has been a prescribed fire act that's been um, put forward a few times uh, and hasn't necessarily gone anywhere, but I do expect elements of that probably will make its way into future bills. And so there's legislation moving forward, which is which is awesome to see and exciting. Um, and then at the state level, there's again been funding support um, and there has been a history of supportive uh, prescribed fire bills from our state legislature um, starting back in 2016 with the uh, prescribed fire pilot project. Uh, and as well as an, another example would be the certified burner program, which was passed by the legislature in 2018, I believe, um, and really providing incentives and encouraging burning. And so uh, overall, sort of our policy and, and there's there's good forward momentum, right, to be supporting prescribed fire and be doing more of it. Um, so for our current state of uh, prescribed fire, as far as like fire implementation, um, you know, our federal agencies are really the ones when we look at sort of the most more recent history, you know, since the wildfire suppression, um, our most recent history, it's really our federal agencies that have been doing a lot of the burning, as well as uh, a few of our, our, our tribes in Washington, some of our larger tribes have been doing a lot of burning as well. And so when we think about what's been happening in Washington, it's generally been those agencies who have been doing burning. And I failed to mention Department of Defense on here. Uh, but that they are also one of the agencies uh, burning on military ugh, military installations in the state. So, you know, so those federal programs are established. Um, they have experience within the agencies to be doing that work. Um, there are challenges and things to, to ramping that up, but they have established programs, right? Where our state agencies are really in the process of building programs. Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has had a program actually for the, you know, over the last uh, 10 years. Um, and is sort of trying to keep that program going and sustain it and, and continue to build it. DNR, uh, Washington Department of Natural Resources, is actively building a prescribed fire program. They've had a few burns this year. Um, and uh, one of the things that's beneficial for that agency is they have a wildfire division. So they have a lot of potential staff they can pull from. Still a lot of this, I'll talk about some of these challenges uh, later on, but wildfire season definitely makes that a challenge for us to actually get that work done, but actively building a program. And I also want to call out state parks. Um, don't have the same amount of staff as either of these other agencies to be able to do prescribed fire, but I know as, uh, as an agency, they're wanting to, to reintroduce fire to their state parks. They have some staff that are really gung-ho about that, and uh, they're implementing some burns. I believe they did a burn with partners in the San Juan Islands, uh, maybe on Jones Island, I think this fall. Um, so really trying to find places where they can introduce fire as well. And then tribes, definitely uh, the Colville tribe, Yakima Nation, Spokane tribe, 
uh, have a uh, large uh, silvicultural forest management and wildfire programs that are able to implement burning. Um, and then there are uh, many tribes across the state who are in the process of building programs or really want to be building programs and just need the, the connections and the abilities to do that. So there's a lot of opportunity uh, with our tribes and a lot of opportunity to, to support them and, and, and really let them, uh, as we've heard from Elizabeth, there's a lot, of, lot to learn. And so uh, allowing them and giving them the space to, to lead as well, and not giving them the space to lead, but, you know, helping them um, and supporting them overall. So that's kind of the state of where we're at currently um, over the last 10, 20, you know, 30 years. Uh, this is just a quick map, just to, uh, I just wanted to, uh, really what this shows, it just shows federal and tribal lands. It's not showing state lands and it's not up to date. But I, I think it does a good job of just laying it out of what we're talking about when we say about the, the potential, right? There's a lot of, of federal, state, and tribal land that we're talking about. And so that's where a lot of the focus has been because that's where a lot of the land has been, right? Um, there's a lot of opportunity to be doing work here. So thinking a little bit about what's emerging and what's kind of new, um, is, is this kind of this focus on more of this community level, local level burning. And um, and really trying to to bring fire back to places that really haven't seen fire in a long time and that aren't you know publicly managed or tribal lands, um, and so when, when I think of with what I think of when I'm I'm talking about this is right our local fire departments and municipalities, uh, cities and counties who are are seeing wildfires threaten their communities and are wanting to do fire mitigation. Um, and one of the steps of fire mitigation. Is, is prescribed fire. It's super effective at reducing fuels, reducing wildfire risk. It's a part of forests. And so people see that connection and want to be engaging on it. Um, and so there's a lot of leadership within um, local municipalities and within fire departments to be taking ownership and leadership um, within prescribed fire, implementing prescribed fire locally. Uh, community organizations, nonprofits, and things like conservation districts that are supporting others in doing this work, as well as in many cases leading this work and have land that they actively manage. Um, and those little nodes are growing as well. And then private landowners, right? Like, uh, especially those who have a strong stewardship sense uh, for their land who are already doing work um, and doing treatments and fuel reduction and see this as the next step again. It's hard with prescribed fire. Uh, you know, state agencies have longstanding programs. How does a private landowner, how do they start? <laughs> Where do they get experience to be able to do burning and who supports them? Where are the contractors and nonprofits and others who can help support them? Uh, we're really at a state where we're weaving these things together um, and trying to support all these efforts simultaneously. Um, and really, these are things that are, like I said, are emerging over the last, you know, really five years or the last few years, right? So this is new things, and we're looking at at places in California and across the country who who have been uh, piloting these things for us to kind of look at and say uh, and to kind of take uh, for Washington. I want to also highlight a couple of um, the things that uh, you know I'm working on uh, in the state and really about encouraging prescribed fire. Um, oops, excuse me, get rid of my Outlook notifications here. Um, so prescribed fire training exchanges, as Elizabeth mentioned, um, uh, we host them in Washington as well. Uh, we hosted our first one in 2017. And this is really about uh, partly about uh, getting you know professional wildfire qualifications for um, uh, uh, in the state, but also creating just opportunities for people to to learn and train and prescribe fire. There's not a lot of opportunities if unless you're in a, a federal agency. How do you get that experience? And so uh, this Trex program is really trying to bring people together for two weeks, uh, really become students of fire, as we like to say, and. Uh, get active and get out on some burns, but also learn about all the elements, all the planning and the prep and all the things that go into a prescribed fire. Um, and so that back, that program is continuing and, and hoping to do some more next year. Uh, prescribed burn associations are really a model that came out of uh, the mid of Great Plains area and it's in other parts of the country as well. It's really kind of when I think the best uh, analogy here is really a barn raising for prescribed fire. It's landowners helping landowners you know, people bringing equipment together, um, just cooperatively burning, right? Uh, and it provides access to landowners. You know, as Elizabeth mentioned, there's a, a, a national professional wildfire qualification system, right? Uh, 
Private landowners can't access that. That doesn't mean the tool should be denied to private landowners. We need to provide them the training and experience so that they can get, they can understand how to use fire and use it safely and effectively. And PBAs can provide access to some of that training and learning as well. Um, and then uh, a program I mentioned earlier came out from some state legislation, the DNR uh, Certified Burner Program. Uh, I named that wrongly on here. And this doesn't train people how to burn, but it certifies those who do know and provides incentives for those folks to continue burning. And that's really, really important to have that support and have that additional little carrot to continue doing this work. Again, you know, I'm coming back to this slide uh, just to show you. Um, Again, the federal, uh, you know, state tribal lands piece, right? But I want to get really excited for a little bit about the other elements that are happening. That's really cool that the federal state partners are continuing to do work and lots of funding. But I'm really excited about these other things that have been happening over, over the last couple of years of um, these emerging you know, sort of grassroots localized type of burning. And I'm I'm not going to get everyone here. I can just talk about what I know. I know there's many other folks who are interested in wanting to build programs. I'm just going to talk here to some some examples that I have, um, and so you know I'll just start. I just want to talk a little bit about each of these and just try to like roll down because uh, just I think it's easy for those who are just focused on federal burning or state burning to get kind of focused on those things and not have that bird's eye view. But this is where I get really excited. So for example, Mount Adams Resource Stewards down in Glenwood, Washington, and Klickitat County have had a burn program. They're a nonprofit, uh, manage a community forest there and have a, a, a burn crew and have been leading burns and helping and now are engaging their partners. They've been starting to work with Yakima Nation, um, helping support their work, as well as the local land trust and the other nonprofit partners. They're trying to build that a community of fire down in that area and, and really be, be leaders in that work. So really exciting stuff. Ego Studies Institute in the South Sound area has actually been around uh, that burn program and the work there has been around for a long time, over the over more than 10 years. Um, and uh, doing prairie and oak burning uh, with uh, the Department of Defense partners, as well as other state agency partners. Um, and I know they've been starting to engage as well with some of the tribes, the Chehalis tribe, for example, and trying to help bring cultural fire um, back to those folks and in other places, uh, you know, in Oregon as well. So really good work from them. Up in San Juan, uh, Islands Conservation District, that's a entity is one of those, like not everyone has active burn programs, but they want to be burning. And so this is an example of that. They have uh, stewardship crews who are doing thinning work and fuels reduction work, and they are doing uh, pile burning, really trying to pile burn for ecological reasons and return carbon back to the soil. Really cool stuff. Ultimately, they would like to be burning and bringing their uh, tribal partners along as well in that work and engaging with the other partners on the islands. So uh, Excited to see where those guys go. Up in the Methow Valley, uh, you have uh, Methow Valley Citizens Council and Fire Adapted Methow Valley, both engaging on prescribed fire and wanting to support prescribed burn associations and burning on private lands. Um, they haven't started doing any burns yet, but they want to do it and there's momentum and I'm really excited about that. Uh, over in Northeast Washington, the Kalispell Tribe, obviously other tribes working on this. I'm calling out Kalispell Tribe because I've been working with them uh, through Trex and we've been trying to support the development and growth of their program, trying to get their, have a cert, having a, a certified burn boss so that they could do lead the work themselves. And so I'm excited to see as they invest more in that program and see that work uh, grow. There's a little unlabeled pin. That's just like, there's no name for it yet, but there's private lands momentum um, growing in that area in sort of the Tri-County Northeast Washington area. Um, Spokane uh, County Fire District 8 uh, is has an, also not done a burn yet, but they are planning and wanting, they're in a part of uh, Spokane County where there's a lot of interface with the city of Spokane and uh, forest land, and they are uh, wanting to help landowners do fuels reduction work. And so hopefully maybe this next year, I might do one of their first burns. Um, moving over to uh, Chelan County, and I know I saw Patrick Haggerty with Cascadia Conservation District on here. Uh, Cascadia Conservation District and their partners, uh, Tomstick Wildfire Stewardship Coalition and others really wanted to support prescribed fire, and they're looking to support uh, private land burning as well. Uh, Chelan County, uh, uh, the, the County of Chelan and the Natural Resources Department has already been engaging with uh, DNR as well as their local fire department and has done a couple burns where their lands are located, that they manage uh, is a, a big sort of checkerboard area and lots of opportunity for cooperative cross-boundary burning with state and federal partners and private lands. Really cool opportunities there. And they've already done some burning and they're looking to do more. And then 
to wrap all that all up. And sorry, I'm trying to go fast because I know we want to get to questions and things like that. Uh, but this is where I get excited, right? Uh, is the Upper Kittitasa County uh, fuels crew? And this is really a, a fire districts in Kittitasa County supporting this work here. Um, back in 2017, with our first treks, we did a burn um, outside the city of Roslyn and engaged with the local fire departments. And then they have just taken it and, and seen the use and power of it. And we've engaged there um, you know, since then through Trex, but they started to grow their own private program, get fuels crews who can help prep the, the burn units and actually staff burns and move that work forward. And so really excited to see where this goes um, over the next few years as they continue to grow their program. You know, the main thing here is, I think it's easy to get, uh, you know, there's, <laughs> Not maybe not a lot of things to get excited about sometimes, but I'm super excited about the way that this is growing. It's not perfect. There's a lot of things that we have to work on, but seeing people step into this is so exciting to me. And I'm 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 just here to like help them. <laughs> and so there's like, you know, you're it's like your your babies uh, growing up and going to college, maybe. Um so I also want to talk about uh and I apologize for I think the slides got a little bit um uh, reformatted or just the colors got messed up. So I apologize for it being difficult to read. Um, I do want to just talk really briefly about some of the challenges and barriers. And this is not just challenges and barriers in Washington, but really across the country. And, and one of the biggest things is having the people to do the work. And that means the number of people, but also people who have the experience. In some cases, when you're talking about federal and state partners, you know, qualifications as well. Um, and so that's definitely, without the people to do it, we're not going to be able to do as much work. And so this is really a big one. Funding, always a challenge, right? People need to get paid and uh, it costs money. So it's really a challenge for us. Uh, the number of days to be able to do the work. And that's a lot of things kind of tie into this, right? It could be impacted by weather and that changes year to year. This spring was really difficult uh, to do burning in Washington. It was so wet. Um, the fuel conditions as well it might be a beautiful sunny day, but it might just, the fuel conditions aren't where we want them. It could be too dry. You know, wildfire season um, uh, takes resources away. It creates, uh, there's fire restrictions during wildfire season. And so that just narrows our opportunities to be able to do work. There's also seasonality. You have to think about, well, there might be nesting birds, for example. So there's other elements that we want to have into consideration. And, you know, and then, you know, and the last thing would be air quality. Um, so th there's a limited number of days that we have to do the work. And that's definitely a challenge. Are there ways we can expand the number? How can we start to work and, and provide more opportunity um, or have exactly the right number of people every day, right, to be able to do the work? So lack of incentives. Um, it's hard work and there's risks involved and it can be challenging to get people motivated to want to do this. Um, it's not people don't treat prescribed fire as an emergency like they do wildfire. and um, if we did, we'd be doing a lot more work, right? And then risk aversion. I mean, fear of fire getting out is definitely a concern. Um, and, you know, anyone who's who's lighting the match understands that the responsibility of, of doing that. And um, so we have to kind of work through that, provide people the tools that they need. Um, yeah, lots of, lots of talk about there as well. Uh, I do kind of want to reframe a little bit because there's a lot of opportunities to say no to prescribed fire. And so I'm really excited about all these opportunities that we can start to say yes to fire. And, um, you know, I think the things like the, the DNR, you know, the certified burner program is really incentivizing. So how do we start to incentivize people to say yes to, uh, how do we start to make sure we have the right number of people on a burn day to be able to burn? Again, there's a lot of, a lot of, from, from the planning stage of a burn, because there's a lot that goes into a fire, right? A burn is just like a couple hours, but all the planning, the uh, pre-treatment work, the, you know, permitting, the actual like, you know, day, you know, day of decision, there's so many opportunities to say no, and that we need to reframe this a little bit and start to say, how do we say yes to fire? How do we encourage fire safely and effectively, of course? Um, how do we how do we start to do more of this? There are barriers that we can work through, yes, but I think there also needs to be sort of a mind shift and a cultural shift in how we approach fire and how we look at where we fit on the landscape in this landscape of fire um, that we already live in. Uh, we're going to have it regardless, so how do we start to have it a, a little bit more on our own terms? Um, and so I, I think that's how I'll leave it today, Katie, and I will um, shoot it back to you.
Thanks, Kara. So we'll go ahead and shift over to our question and answer session. Um, I really want to thank both Elizabeth and Kara. We really appreciate being able to hear from different perspectives from both California and Washington that we can learn from, as well as different types of burning, burning practices and knowledge. So let's go ahead and shift over to our first question. So smoke is definitely a concern that um, emerges around fire of any kind. And we have a question specifically about smoke and Puget Sound from Timothy Leadingham. But I'm wondering if each of you can speak a little bit to what you see as um, the connections between fire and smoke and how it's different between prescribed fire and wildfire. Yeah, sure, Katie, I'll, I'll start. Um, and I'd love to hear uh, Elizabeth's takes on, take on this as well. Um, I guess my main, well, there's there's a lot. This is a big topic, of course. And, you know, one of the challenges that we have is smoke impacts people's health, right? So that's a very real thing that happens. And people who are uh, susceptible um, and vulnerable to smoke, we have to be considering them. Um, I kind of, though, bring it back to, I guess, when we talk about smoke in general, like, uh, we're going to have, like I said, we live in a fire environment. Fire was in the landscapes. Uh, all around us. And so we're going to have fire and we're going to have smoke. So, you know, and I'm not talking about prescribed fire. I'm just talking about all fire, right? Wildfire as well. And so as a, as a state, as a community, as individuals, we need to take responsibility for that and start to um, provide the tools and resources and knowledge for people to take, uh, to take action to protect their health. Right. And so that's, um, <clears throat> providing, letting people know how to assess whether they're being impacted by smoke, how to, you know, where to access information about when there are bad air quality days, what to do if there are bad air quality days. Um, clearly, like, we have lots of vulnerable communities across the state who can't take action. So how do we help support them, get them clean air spaces? It's really a big, complicated topic. I, I think prescribed fire is just a part of that as well, of, like, this is a reality. We're going to have fire. We know we need to do this mitigation work return fire to the land because the land needs it, but also to, to reduce future wildfire risk and 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 uh, future risk to individuals like live livelihoods, right? Um, so I, again, I think that while we talk about prescribed fire in the sense of like, yes, prescribed fire is planned. You can do it on days we're gonna have good air quality. There'll be, it's limited, right? It's a couple of hours or a couple of days versus weeks and it's a smaller duration, a little, uh, smaller intensity. Um, I think that that all is true and that is, and that's, those are things that we can work in. But I think in general, we have to become smoke ready in general <laughs> for wildfire season and prescribed fire season. And, um, and we need to be giving people the tools. And maybe that means we need to like ensure that it's medically necessary, right? For certain individuals to have access to clean air spaces and figure out how to do that. Lots of things to talk about there, really big topic. Um, I but want to pass it to Elizabeth. Good morning. Yeah, Carrie, you're right. It is a huge topic. Um, in our area, we're really lucky in one sense that um, all of the people that live in this area love fire. Um, when we're doing training exchanges, it's really interesting to see community members drive by and they basically start to yell at our participants like, don't put that fire out. You know, this is really an interesting thing um, compared to the rest of civilization, because for our people, fire is really important. Like I said, it's fire's family. So we do have very stringent policies through our tribe for our air quality, and we do work with Humboldt County Air Quality. The upside to all of that is we've been able to create clean, uh, clean air facilities here on this extension of the reservation. So we open those up for community members where we you know, provide meals and uh, games and things for them to do, uh, movies to watch, whatever they wanna do while we're doing this, if it's something that really impacts them. We also have um, uh, air purifiers in every home, especially of our elders and our medically sensitive people. And so we put out information to the community ahead of time, where these places are at, when they'll be open, um, who to contact if there's a situation. For us, you know, like Kara was saying, uh, smoke is a huge issue here. It lays down in these valleys and it can stay for weeks when there's a wildfire going on. Uh, during prescribed fire, they generally tend to lift right up out of the canyon and flow out of the area. 
And so when you have a community that's fire adapted, that lives and breathes fire, I should say, it's really more easy, um, or I should say easier for us to be able to work in this environment. But once we leave our area and have to go work outside and work in other systems where the permitting is much different than our own, it makes it really um, come to light in our mind how much further we need to grow, how much we need to be able to provide for our community, for our people, and the surrounding areas. We have a lot of prescribed fire agencies that are popping up just because of the training exchanges they've participated in with us. And so we've also given them those same tools. You know, these are the things you need to do. Notifies the, notify the clinics, notify the schools, notify the local um, little newspapers or radio station that this is going to be happening. And we do that, you know, a few days ahead of every time we burn so that we're able to um, keep our community safe, keep the people safe and um, basically stay ahead of anything that would happen, you know, if for instance, someone were to get sick from the smoke or someone were to have an issue. We tried to mitigate those things um, you know, as far in advance as possible. Thank you both for your responses to that. That's really helpful to illustrate the variety of considerations that go into the differences between prescribed fire and wildfire with consideration to smoke. So the next question that we're going to go to is from Josie West. The question is for Elizabeth. You said your people come from all over. You said people come from all over to learn from your program. Do you do recruiting or do most come on their own accord? You know, a lot of it tends to be word of mouth. Um, I've heard some unusual statements about our training exchanges, like they're an eco training exchange or an eco tourism training, which is really interesting. Um, for us, we um, do advertise on the Nature Conservancy's prescribed fire page. Uh, we put our trainings out ahead of time, but we tend to receive a lot of interest from tribal communities. A lot of people are having trouble getting their burning rights back. A lot of tribes don't remember their burning history. And so we are part of the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network, which reaches out to tribes across the United States and around the world, actually. We've been in contact with some tribes in Australia. We've got seven tribes here in the United States that are active in the Indigenous Peoples Burning Network. And so for us, you know, it's been really interesting to be able to put all of these things together, bring all these people together and learn from each other. And so our training exchange is um, definitely, we do broadcast burning, we don't do pile burning like a lot of the training exchanges and that mostly um, benefits tribal uh, communities because you know, for us, we have large land masses that need to be taken care of in a timely manner so that we can protect our people, protect our um, land, protect the people around us. So yeah, we bring people from all over and it's a lot of it is word of mouth, but there is a lot that comes through what I call my repeat offenders. They are people that come to our training exchanges and they continue to come back um, and they bring people with them. So it's really fun. That's awesome. Thank you so much. The next question that we're going to go to is from Steve Andringa, and this is for both of you. Uh, one of the key factors that limits the amount of prescribed burning projects is qualified personnel to implement the, the, the burns. What tools are available to better share personnel between federal, state, tribal, and private ownerships to both plan and implement more of these projects? Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly a challenge. Um, you know, and actually, I think it's California has a, a larger MOU uh, memorandum of understanding that allows for agencies and others to sign on and to work together. Um, so there's opportunities to, to implement things like that. Um, uh, so there's examples out there which would allow federal, state, tribal, and others to, to get together and burn. One of the challenges, of course, is the qualification system uh, for these folks, right? So private burners don't necessarily need to follow like the same standards. Um, but federal state agencies and tribes often do, um, if they're working under BIA in particular for tribes, need to follow the same sort of standards. And so as long as the, the standards don't, like if there's one standard for, you know, professional wildland firefighters, there's not for private landowners, that doesn't really mesh yet. Um, but at least for those who do follow, or like work in the same kind of systems, uh, there's agreements and things. And I love, love the idea. I know the Washington Prescribed Fire Council, um, 
has some interest in leading uh, the development of more of a statewide MOU that people could sign onto and it would allow for people to work together. And having a, re like having a mechanism like that would be huge. Um, so Steve, reach out to the Prescribed Fire Council uh, and, and push that because I think that would be huge uh, to get that opportunity and, and make those connections. Um, again, it's hard for, if you're a private landowner to get you know, sometimes to get some of those folks to come play in your in your neck of the woods. Um, but I think as we do more fire, and I'd love to hear like Elizabeth, her perspective, because I'm sure it's very, it, you know, there's some cool things happening down there in California, but I am hopeful as like, as more fire happens and private landowners uh, get more engaged, that maybe there might be some more opportunities for kind of bringing folks together across, across those divisions of qualification. Yeah, um, this is actually really a great question. So we've been really lucky in this area with our um, trainings, and we do have a full-time crew that uh, participates with the local tribes. We share training dates and information that makes it um, available to all of us to be able to get training done, not just within our own areas. The greatest thing about this is we've been working with the U.S. Forest Service. We're working with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Cal Fire, um, the Karuk and Hupa tribes, uh, the Park Service. All of these entities have been reaching out to each other, and we've actually gone into the parks and burned with them. So it's really nice to see this happening because for us, we've integrated all of these agencies that can't seem to get along for any reason whatsoever. All of us seem to believe that we have um, the answer, you know, the what's going to happen is going to happen in our area. Well, it's not necessarily true for all of us. You know, if you can be able to pull all these agencies together, have a conversation, find common ground and be able to work together, it benefits the entire planet. It's not just, you know, an individual approach. Uh, burning with the Park Service uh, in our ancestral territory had been a dream for us for a long time because they were burning Yurok ancestral land without Yurok's involved. And so once we were able to bridge that gap and to be able to work with them and have Cal Fire ask us, you know, if they're burning right, you know, I've never had Cal Fire ask me that question ever. And it felt really good to be able to stand there with the battalion chief and say, well, you know, you need to be doing this or you need to be doing that in order to make this burn a little bit safer or burn a little hotter or do the job you want it to do. Uh, all of a sudden, I'm, I might want to say that my head swelled just a teeny bitty bit <laughs> just because it was really nice to have, you know, a person in the suppression world ask a cultural practitioner how they felt about a burn. Thank you both, and thank you for sharing that story. It's, um, it's really good to hear about that exchange of, of information happening and that knowledge kind of transferring across. Uh, the next question that we have is from Gus Seishas, and the question is, for cultural burns, what type of landscapes are desirable? For example, are lowland valleys only of interest or are higher elevations, steeper slopes, et cetera, also important? Um, for example, how does that change consideration? Sorry, not for example. <laughs> how does that change consideration of land ownership issues, seasonality, and other considerations? I'm assuming that question's for me. <laughs> um, Cultural Fire Management Council doesn't just burn for basket materials or food securities or medicines. We also do prairie and meadow restorations for reintroduction of elk into our high country. So I'm very happy to say that currently the area that I live in, which is about 47 miles up the river from the coast, uh, from the ocean to where, you know, the Klamath River meets, we actually have elk in our territory now. It has been years since elk have traveled from the coast up through the high country ranges and into our territory. And we're working collectively with the Karuk tribe to open up their pathways so their historic pathways and our historic pathways for our elk are now beginning to meet in the high country. We burn in some of the steepest terrain that um, a, a mountain goat could possibly want to traverse. And it's really interesting for us to bring all of these participants in um, and do these field trips with them to show them what the terrain's like, what the environment's like, how it is to be able to work with fire in such an environment. 
And it's really a great feeling to know that, you know, we can pretty much burn, whether it be grasslands, mountainous terrain, prairies, meadows, um, right down into waterways and still be able to maintain a safety level that works for all of our participants. So we, we teach every possible type of burning there is, to be honest. Thank you very much. Uh, I think our next question could be for either or both of you. It's from Kate Anderson from Sightlight Institute. In your experience, has pre-burn thinning been necessary or helpful for broadcast burns you've participated in or observed? Yeah, I think it's at least here in Washington that tends to be standard practice. I mean, certainly with, with wildfire suppression and increased growth of, of more trees, right? We have more trees per acre than we should. Um, that definitely is a pretty standard practice. I mean, ideally, you can get some commercial thinning out of it, but also it gets expensive, right, when you start to do pre-commercial thinning and getting people hand crews and stuff in there to do some of that work. Um, so it's definitely common practice. Um, I don't think it necessarily has to be done that way. I don't think you need to necessarily do that, but it definitely makes, I think, for most folks, makes them feel more comfortable, it makes it easier to move around uh, in the burn unit as well. Uh, so, yeah, it's definitely... Um, it's definitely utilized uh, pretty commonly here in Washington. Thank you. The next question we have is from Brown and Brandon Housekeeper. The question is, what are the specific barriers to use of prescribed burns that we can address today to prevent the larger wildfires? And I would like to add on a little bit to that question. If you see the barriers um, to burning being primarily at the local, state, or federal level, and how you see those barriers changing. Uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot. Um, oh, it's, a, it's a big question that you added on there, uh, Katie. Uh, I, I do think that, I mean, I don't know if I'd like pick a barrier, like one thing. I do think, I, well, I guess there's a couple of things. There's there's capacity, right? And that's that's tied to funding. That's tied to getting people. Like it's, you know, it's hard to get the numbers of people that you need. The other challenge is like, we don't need people the whole year. We need people on the burn day. And so that's like a huge thing. It's like, we need all these people on the day that we are ready to burn. We have to, you know, Stephen mentioned in his question, how do we work together to ensure that we, hey, if we're not burning over here, we can support our partners over here. So capacity doesn't mean always just like hiring more people. It's connecting everyone so that we can do more. Um, but it also probably means like, you know, getting more people involved in fire, you know, getting, that's why I'm like excited about fire districts getting trained up to do this because then you have, this huge workforce who is getting more experience with fire to be able to help them with wildland fire, but also then they have you have a, a, a workforce that you could potentially tap into um, to help with with burns. So I just think capacity when it comes down to it, if you've got a burn day and everyone's like, well, we're just going to send everyone to burn, you know, on this one burn. And this happens with federal and state agencies as well. This isn't just like, you know, it happens with everyone. But what if we had capacity to burn both, both places, right? So I think capacity is huge. Um, you know, there's elements too of air quality and smoke and other elements, but I think like another key thing that people can do today, like people up here is, is just be vocal about our support for prescribed fire. I think what people, you know, they're, who's the loudest voice in the room and how do we make our support of prescribed fire voices louder? How do we start to raise awareness? And really, like I said before, like, how do we start to say yes to prescribed fire? How do we start to ask for prescribed fire to happen? And hold people accountable when it doesn't happen. So um, certainly capacity, and then the things that we can do is all just like be asking for this more. And that's at all levels, I guess. I didn't talk about levels. Sorry, Katie. Uh, well, I'll pass it to Elizabeth. <laughs> Thanks, Kara. And I also wanted to apologize. I think I uh, got into this question too soon before Elizabeth had a chance to answer the previous question about pre-burn thinning. Um, I can repeat the question if that'd be helpful, Elizabeth, um, but we'd love to hear your thoughts both on the question of thinning as well as on what the barriers are. Um, yeah, that, those are loaded questions. <laughs> um, pre-burn thinning. We, um, we have a full-time fields crew that basically works on our units uh, throughout the season. 
we tend to do our um, fire line preps, you know, basically six to 10 feet down to bare mineral soil. We'll limb up anything that will potentially cause a crown fire or something that, you know, could disrupt a uh, species in our burn unit. As far as, um, you know, the, the cooperation, I guess, with other agencies, Cultural Fire Management Council is actually in the process of hiring a burn boss. We are in the process of building a training facility. So we are buying land, uh, building a facility where we'll be able to house participants, where we'll be able to train uh, people, have classroom trainings and all of the things we need. Uh, instead of having to utilize a tribal facility, we will now have our own facility to be able to train people ourselves. We do have um, part-time crews that come in and work with us and we do cooperative burns with um, other agencies. So the Mid Klamath Watershed Council, for instance, if they have a particular burn day, they don't have enough people, they'll reach out to us, we'll send a crew up to them. We do that with all the different agencies in this area and they've been um, kind enough to be able to reciprocate with us and send people in to work with us. So. You know, the biggest issue for all of those things is the permitting, the qualifications, um, what it takes to pull off a burn. You know, these are long hours that we put in, you know, sometimes I'm out in the field for 17 hours when we're burning. Those are long days, you know, so we pull everybody together, we bring as many people in as we can, and we've worked well enough with all these different agencies that we are able to pull a workforce together real quickly and to pull off a nice burn um, in a timely manner. I hope that answered all those questions. Yes, thank you so much. And we have one final question that's for you, Elizabeth, before we wrap up the session. What are the most significant challenges and successes that have emerged regarding tribal sovereignty and fire policy during your career? Sorry, my computer decided to do something on its own. <laughs> You know, one of the greatest successes for me is building a great relationship with the air quality district here in Humboldt County. Um, when I first took over this position, I was really frightened because the gentleman ahead of me said, oh, my goodness, she's a dragon lady. You know, she's going to hold you to all of these things that are just going to make your job impossible. And so, of course, I walk into her office and I'm frightened beyond, you know, imagination at this point. And after a few minutes with her, I realized that this gentleman just wasn't approaching her in a proper manner. <laughs> and so building that relationship with those air quality um, departments is really huge because she basically is at a point now where she says to me, you're a sovereign nation. You don't have to follow these regulations as other landowners would. And that's simply based on our track record. You know, um, We've never lost a prescribed fire. We've worked very uh, closely with all these different agencies. We invite agencies out to see what we do so that they can build a comfort level with us. And it's, it's really important, the people, the people aspect of it, putting all the people together, letting them see that, you know, we take our job seriously. We may not be a suppression entity, but we definitely care for our environment and our people, and we care for what we do. And we believe that every human being has a responsibility to care for this planet. And so we share our knowledge openly. We make it possible for everybody to learn how important it is to care for the land, how it is important to work with the different agencies, to do the permitting process, and to basically not bite the hand that feeds you. Thank you so much. Thank you both Elizabeth and Kara for all of your insights during this discussion. It's given us a lot of food for thought for how we continue to say yes to fire. As a quick reminder to all of the attendees, first of all, thank you for attending this session. And the next session starts in one hour at 1130 Pacific time. And the topic will be evolving management for state forest lands, sorry, evolving management of state forest lands for public benefit. See you there. Thanks.